And it's wonderful uh, to be speaking in this series as someone who was a graduate student at um, Balliol many years ago. So uh, like pretty much everyone else, I've had my pre-existing prejudices confirmed by the pandemic. And in a sense, this paper is an attempt to articulate some of that. In October, 2019, the Global Health Security Index published its ranking of countries in terms of preparedness for a health crisis. This was a mere two months before China alerted the WHO of, of the outbreak of an acute respiratory illness in Wuhan, the new type of coronavirus now known as COVID-19. In the ranking, the United States was placed top with the United Kingdom second. These were two countries that in fact experienced great difficulty in controlling COVID-19, at least before the availability of vaccines. Meanwhile, countries that did a much better job, such as Singapore and New Zealand, ranked 28th and 54th, respectively. This underlines not only how poorly prepared some major advanced democracies were, but also how bad we are at measuring such preparedness. Of course, preparedness for a health crisis has many dimensions. For example, stockpiling personal protective equipment, ensuring the availability, um, ensuring the, sorry, <clears throat> ensuring the ability to cope with disrupted global supply chains and establishing clear lines of authority and so on. But today I want to focus on another kind of preparedness that the COVID pandemic makes salient. And this preparedness is preparedness in the ethical categories we bring to bear in trying to understand and cope with such a crisis. The need for ethical categories, for a clear and defensible articulation of our goals in health policy is often obscured by politicians' need to avoid being seen to make controversial value judgments. In the United Kingdom, the government reiterated the mantra that it was following the science. But this attempt to convert a political value judgment into a matter of technical expertise is, of course, conceptually obtuse. There is no question of simply following the science when it comes to public policy, because science offers signposts to belief about the world, but does not tell us how we should act in the world. For that, we need to conjoin our most reliable beliefs about the world with clear and defensible conceptions of our values. So the question I want to raise today is that of our intellectual preparedness to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of our grasp of the relevant values at play and their interrelations. Philosophers, I believe, can play an important role in improving our preparedness to deal with health crises like COVID-19 by interrogating some of the key ideas we bring to bear in thinking through the challenges that such crises pose. Now, the easy way for me to establish my thesis would be to target the predominance of utilitarian and economistic modes of thinking in public health. Despite their prominence, due in large part to the aura of objectivity and mathematical precision that they convey, such approaches tend to be guilty of two large errors. First, the tendency to reduce values to what is actually valued, often indeed valued by the crude measure of what one is willing to prepare, what one is willing to pay for, Second, because they're committed to forms of optimization and aggregation across persons that lose sight of the inherent dignity of each individual human being. Indeed, this second objection was part of the popular dismay at the UK government's initial policy, or seemingly initial policy, of herd immunity. Now, instead of this easy target, I'm going to focus on a public health discourse that does claim to uphold the dignity of each individual human being. And this is the discourse of human rights. Although it embodies a very important and laudable ideal, I believe that much of our contemporary thinking about human rights, especially in the health context, is itself in very bad shape. And failures to understand human rights and how they relate to other values hamper us in being able to formulate clear and justified responses to the COVID pandemic that our fellow citizens could actually get behind. So I'm gonna focus on two mistakes about rights in this talk, a mistake about their scope and a mistake about their content. And I'm also going to talk about errors relating to 
how human rights relate to two other important values. One of these is common goods, including um, public health goods, and the other value is democracy, how human rights relate to democracy. Now, in discussing human rights, I'm going to take as my main example the human right to health, since it seems to be the most salient one for this context. The right to health is referred to in many international instruments, for example, Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and also Article 12 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which refers to, I quote, the right of everyone to the highest, to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Now we could quibble about that formulation. There's lots to be said about it. I won't talk about it here. I'll just take it as given that there is such a right. So the first error I say bedevils a lot of human rights discourse is errors about the scope of rights. By scope, I mean the subject matter of the duties associated with the right in question. It is natural to think that some human rights obligations come, or I'm gonna use obligations and duties interchangeably, some human rights obligations come within the scope of some rights, whereas other human rights obligations come within the scope of different human rights. So the duty to prevent people from suffering hunger comes within the right to food, or perhaps more broadly, the right to an adequate standard of living, not the right to freedom of religion or to a fair trial. The duty to allow people to participate in the political life of their community comes under the right to political participation, not the right to privacy or the right to work. So the idea is rights have their particular scope. That's why we have a number of distinct rights and their scope relates to the subject matter of their um, associated obligations. So let's consider the right to health then. Which entitlements fall within its scope? So you might think that there are some pretty obvious entitlements, rights to certain forms of um, medical treatment, like first aid or kidney dialysis treatment, rights to certain public health measures, for example, like vaccination program for COVID, rights to certain social determinants, of health as they're known, for example, clean water or clean air. But what about the following? What about the following? Do the following entitlements come within the scope of the right to health? Does the right to health include an entitlement to food? Does it include an entitlement to housing? Does it include an entitlement to life? Does it include an entitlement to education? These are genuine questions. I hope you're answering them in your minds. Does it include the right to privacy? Does the right to health include the right to access information? Does it include a right to gender equality? Does it include a right to employment? Does it include a right to social inclusion? Does it include a right to freedom from torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment? Well, according to the standard view of human rights, adopted within the United Nations system, adopted by the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, adopted by leading writers on the right to health, like Lawrence Gostin at Georgetown, all of those entitlements come within the right to health. So the understanding that is now orthodox amongst those who are engaged in human rights discourse in the health sphere is that pretty much the right to health overlaps massively in content with almost every other right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the seeming rationale for this is that all of these entitlements clearly bear on health. If you're deprived of food, this will affect your health. If you're deprived of housing or employment, this will affect your interest in health. Uh, and this massive expansion in the scope of the right to health is not unique to the right to health. It is a feature now of the way in which rights are generally interpreted within the human rights system. So very recently, there was uh, issued by the um, Human Rights Committee, the General Comment 36 on the right to life. The right to life, which was formerly understood as civil and political right, not a socioeconomic right, is reinterpreted in this general comment as the right to enjoy a life with dignity. And then that becomes a rationale for saying, well, you can't have a right with dignity 
unless a whole series of socioeconomic rights are guaranteed in your case. So therefore that's gonna say include things like employment and an adequate standard of living, et cetera, because you can't have right to life without an ad, uh, to a dignified life without an adequate standard of living. So what happens is the orthodox view is to adopt this bloated conception of the scope of rights. And that results in massive overlaps in the contents of different rights. So even something like what looks like a discrete right, the right to health ends up including almost the whole of the rest of the rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, I think this is a deep conceptual mistake. It undermines the very rationale of having a list of rights. What's the point of enumerating distinct rights if their scope of coverage is actually massively overlapping? It undermines also our ability to identify whether a given right is fulfilled. If I'm concerned in assessing whether the right to health is being secured in a certain country, but I have to then go through all those entitlements to figure out whether it's being secured, then in effect, what you're saying is to know whether the right to health is being secured, you've got to know if in effect whether all rights are being secured because the right to health is no longer one right among others. And I think the further problem is this process dilutes the normative focus of each right. The whole point of having discrete rights is they help us focus on particular ethically salient considerations. But once you broaden out the scope, then that focus becomes lost. I think there is a deeper problem that um, is the explanation for this uh, trend of thought, this bloating in the scope of rights. And that is the tendency, which I think is a profound error, to identify the human right to health with our interest in health. So if the, our interest in health is simply what we think the human right to health is, that anything that bears on our interest in health that can affect it, enhance it, or make, is detrimental to it, suddenly becomes, falls within the purview of the right to health. But I think that's a terrible mistake because you cannot simply identify your interest in health with your right to health. If someone donates to me their spare healthy kidney when I'm in need of a transplant, that certainly furthers my interest in health, but I don't have a right to their spare healthy kidney. And I wouldn't have a right to their spare healthy kidney because my interest in having their spare healthy kidney does not generate an obligation on them to surrender their spare healthy kidney to me. So there's a big difference between rights and interests and that comes in the fact that they have obligations. And what I'm suggesting here is a better way, a more conceptually respect, uh, respectable way of thinking about the right to health is not saying any entitlement that bears on our interest in health, but rather any entitlement that pertains to a certain kind of subject matter. And I think we should confine that subject matter to obligations relating to medical treatment public health measures and certain social determinants of health, not that massive shopping list that I identified earlier, which has become part of the orthodox understanding of the right to health. So part of the problem here, I think, is Jonathan Mann's claim. Jonathan Mann is a great American public health figure who was uh, very important in the American and UN campaigns relating to HIV AIDS. His claim was that health and human rights are complementary approaches to the central problem of defining and advancing human well-being, to which I want to say yes and no. You can't defend human rights without reference to human interests, that's for sure, but they are not the same as human interests. And to give you another example, if human rights were simply the same as human interests, then you'd be justified in torturing one person in order to prevent three other innocent people from being tortured, because the interest of one person in not being tortured would be outweighed by the interest of three other people not being tortured. But rights do not reduce to interests. They are interests insofar as they generate obligations and obligations erect barriers to those kinds of trade-offs. So that's the first kind of error I want to identify in our conceptual repertoire in thinking about human rights and public health, that we've adopted this incredibly bloated view of the scope of rights or the sort of subject matter, a given right like the right to health covers. And the result of that is massive overlaps amongst rights and inability to get to the particular normatively salient focus that each right is supposed to have. 
The second error I wanted to point out is the content of rights. Um, and even if we have a subject matter in focus, there's another question, say we agree that the subject matter of rights is, as I've suggested, duties to do with medical treatment, with public health measures, with certain social determinants of health, then the question arises, okay, if that's the subject matter of my right to health, what precisely is the content of my entitlements with that subject matter? Um, now, an account of, um, the, of the content of these obligations um, that's typically adopted by um, the orthodox understanding of human rights, that account tends to ignore the fact that in order to identify obligations under the right to health, you've got to factor in issues like cost, right? So one of the reasons I don't have a right to your spare healthy kidney is that it would be too costly for you to be under the burden of being required to surrender your spare healthy kidney. So my interest is one thing, my, whether my interest generates an obligation is a separate matter, and you've got to look at issues of cost and feasibility in determining whether in fact I have an obligation, whether an obligation arises from my interest, and that obligation is the content of my right. Now, as I say, there's a tendency, a strong tendency in the human rights discourse to ignore that issue, to simply say, whatever furthers my interest in health comes under the content of the right to health. And this tendency even applies to the most stringent obligations in the human rights system, the obligations that I've written about for the World Bank called minimum core obligations. So minimum core obligations are those obligations relating to a human right that must be fulfilled immediately. So there's this understanding in human rights that sometimes resource limitations make it impossible for rights to be immediately fulfilled. So there is an idea of progressive realization. You can fulfill them over time uh, as resources allow. But there is a subset of obligations where that doctrine doesn't apply. These obligations are so urgent, all states must fulfill them immediately. An example might be, for example, to prevent people dying from hunger. That's an immediate obligation. The obligation to provide them with nutritious, good quality food is an obligation that has to be realized over time in most cases because of resource constraints. So even with respect to the notion of minimum core obligations, the tendency of, for example, General Comment 14, which is the most authoritative UN document on the right to health, is to make bloated claims about what exactly are these minimum core obligations. And rather than go into details, I'm simply going to quote here um, John Tobin, who's an international lawyer at Melbourne University, one of the leading writers on the right to health. And he says this about um, General Comments 14's account of the content of the right, of, of the minimum core obligations under the right to health. He says, the, the vision of the minimum core obligation of states under the right to health, as advanced by the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee, is disassociated from the capacity of states to realize this vision. It simply does not offer a principled, practical, or coherent rationale, which is sufficiently sensitive to the context in which the right to health may be operationalized. Putting that very briefly, the characterization of the minimum core obligations, those that must be fulfilled immediately by all states, simply fails to take into account issues of cost and feasibility. But if you ignore those considerations, you're not really talking about obligations. Now, it's on the basis of this kind of loose way of characterizing the content of rights that people like William Easterly, development economist, has written that the right to health is useless in terms of guiding policy because it represents, quote, a claim on funds that has no natural limit since any of us could get healthier with more care. So again, the thought is if you determine the content of rights by the, what benefits my interest, what furthers my interest, in health, then of course, it's going to be the case that pretty much there's no limit to what can be done to further my interest in health. But it doesn't follow from that, that all these things are things that I'm entitled to, to, entitled to as a matter of right. So someone might say at this point, why am I being so pedantic? Why not celebrate this demanding conception as an aspirational ideal? And the answer has got to be that human rights are not merely ideals. They're meant to generate duties. They're meant to generate obligations. They're meant to be the sorts of things that if we fail to comply with them, we are blameworthy. We are acting wrongfully. They're not mere ideals. 
And a broader illustration of this tendency, it's not just in the UN, it's also in the European system of human rights, the tendency to simply say, oh, a right exists because an interest will be furthered. So that tendency is very pronounced in the doctrine of proportionality, which is very influential in the European human rights system, also very influential in other countries, not so much in the United States. Um, Matthias Kuhn, the German uh, public lawyer, who's one of the leading proponents of this doctrine, has a very telling quotation. Here he's defending this document, but this is what he says. A rights holder does not have very much in virtue of having a right. An infringement of the scope of the right merely serves as a trigger to initiate an assessment of whether the infringement is justified. So uh, think about that. A rights holder does not have very much in virtue of having a right. Uh, to me, that's a reductio of the idea that they have a right if they don't have very much. But it follows necessarily from this view because from the fact that something will benefit you, from the fact that you have an interest in something, nothing much follows, right? He's absolutely right about that. But rights are not meant to be simply interests that we have. They're meant to be, um, they're meant to be um, generators of obligations which offer robust protections against countervailing considerations. And only in extremists do we usually countenance the thought that these obligations can be overridden. So to say, for example, having a right not to be tortured does not give me very much, um, automatically leads to the conclusion, we're not really talking about a right not to be tortured, we're simply talking about an interest which could be overridden. So we need to think hard about the content of, of obligations and that involves thinking about whether what they supposedly demand is possible for us to deliver and whether it's possible for it to be delivered without excessive cost. And also to think about things like, well, if something's gonna be upheld as a right, it better be compatible with upholding certain other things as a right. So there must be this requirement of coherence with respect to the whole set of rights we're prepared to countenance. And it must be possible to comply with their requirements as a total body, not just one by one. If we don't do this, then we risk subordinating some things that truly are rights entitlements to things that are not really rights entitlements because they will all have come under this bloated conception of what I'm entitled to as a matter of right. And in fact, if one had a cynical view, you might think that you know, someone who was interested in undermining human rights would actually encourage this tendency of bloating the content of human rights because then they'd be able to say, look, human rights are these incredibly demanding aspirations. It's not possible for anyone to fulfill all of them. So I need to choose which ones I'm gonna fulfill. I'm choosing these ones. It shouldn't be like that. The obligations imposed by human rights are such that only an extremist should it be the case that the obligations are overridden. Okay, so those are the two errors about rights that I think are endemic to the human rights discourse at present that I think create huge problems. If we adopt the more analytically rigorous conception of human rights that I've been advocating, then we'll find out two things about health policy. The first is that we can't appeal to the right to health alone. We also have to appeal to other rights. So the idea that you can base global health policy, as some people believe, as Lawrence Gostin believes, exclusively on the right to health is gonna be a mistake because we also have to appeal to other rights. For example, perhaps the most important way that you could further women's health in the world today is through the provision of education, but that would not come under the right to health, that would come under the right to education. The second thing I think we would discover is that we can't just appeal to rights. We also have to appeal to other values and um, values that I want to highlight, the common goods. So again, this contradicts Gaston's view that we could simply do global health policy on the back of a theory of rights. It's not enough to say we've got to go beyond the right to health to include other rights. We also have to go beyond rights to include common goods. So I want to talk a little bit about common goods and their relations to rights. So what are common goods? So one kind of common good would be living in a culture where there's kind of shared commitment amongst people to health and fitness. Another kind of common good would be a culture of altruism and solidarity, where, for example, people are willing to participate in clinical trials in order to generate socially beneficial forms of medicine, etc. Now, as Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, said, um, solidarity was a key factor in whether any society was able to muster an effective response to the pandemic. I'm just quoting from his book, um, Values, because it's interesting to see a banker talking about the importance of solidarity in this way. 
People went beyond compliance with the law and engaged in the mass efforts of community altruism. People sewed masks, delivered food to vulnerable populations, and publicly cheered the heroism of frontline workers. As private voluntary groups um, to address community needs burgeoned, governments started formal volunteer campaigns. In the UK, an appeal for NHS volunteers received over 1 million applicants. Governments encouraged such altruism by emphasizing the good that social distancing did for others, etc. So a culture of health and fitness, a culture of solidarity, are common goods that promote health. But what does it mean to say that they're common goods? Now, the standard interpretation that has been dominant for so many years is an aggregative utilitarian conception that says the common good just means where the overall balance of people's interests lie. So you take all the ways in which something would benefit people, all the ways in which something would disbenefit them, and the common good would be where you get the greatest balance of good benefit or the disbenefit. But that's the utilitarian conception that I started off saying is inadequate because it doesn't afford sufficient protections for individuals. In this process of winners and losers, some people may be unjustly sacrificed on the altar of maximizing utility. Instead, the conception of the common good that I'm putting forward here is an Aristotelian conception. And that conception of a good, the common good, has the following aspect. Something will be a common good, let's say the English language. The English language will be a common good if it serves everyone's interest, and it does serve everyone's interest in being able to communicate, serves everyone's interest in the same way. We're all uh, benefited by having a shared language, by being able to communicate. And serving one person's interest is not at the expense of serving someone else's interest. So my using the English language is in no way at the expense of you or anybody else using the English language. So that's how I'm understanding the notion of the common good notion that is not aggregative, that goes back to Aristotle. If we see rights in the common good in this way, then I think we have the prospect for a more harmonious relationship between the two notions um, than what we would normally get in an aggregative conception of the common good, where there's this perennial worry that a minority will be crushed because its interest will be outweighed by the interest of the majority. The majority of um, Romans who want to get the pleasure of seeing um, Christians being eaten by lions, overriding the interests of the Christians who will get eaten. So if we go with this view uh, that I'm adopting, I think what we'll find is that some common goods are essentially concerned with protecting human rights. So a system of fair trials, a vaccination program um, geared towards generating herd immunity, all these are common goods that arguably secure basic rights of ours. But there'll be other common goods that go beyond what we can claim as a matter of right. NHS workers probably couldn't claim as a matter of right that people clapped for them uh, in appreciation. And indeed, if they claimed that as a matter of right, it would deny the distinctive value of that being done in a way that wasn't obligatory. So there'll be aspects of common goods that do not protect rights, that go beyond rights. And this explains um, this, this explains that, um, so, sorry, um, so one, one way to think about this, um, to give it a more concrete example, would be to say, think about um, an academic culture, an academic culture in which um, there is a strong feeling of prohibition against plagiarism. So you would say that is a common good. It benefits everyone. It benefits everyone in the same way. My being benefited by that non-plagiarism culture isn't at the expense of you being benefited. But it also secures a right. People have a right not to be plagiarized. Now contrast another aspect, another common good in academic culture, which is that people are generally nice and helpful to each other. Again, that's a common good. Being in such a culture where people are helpful and supportive of each other benefits everyone, benefits everyone in the same way. It's benefiting one person is not at the expense of benefiting anyone else but we would not normally say that people had a right to this kind of nice, helpful treatment. There are interesting issues there that we can debate, but that's the kind of contrast that I'm thinking about. Sometimes common goods secure rights, sometimes common goods go beyond uh, what rights are involved. Now, some of I'd say there's nothing new here. It's long been recognized that we need both individual rights and public health goods in formulating a defensible public health policy. And there's an interesting discussion of this issue from a historical perspective in John Fabian Witt's new book, American Contagions, 
Epidemics and Law from Smallpox to COVID-19, which was published last year. Witt refers to the great American public health figure I've already mentioned, Jonathan Mann, and his pioneering work on HIV AIDS, uh, both for the US and for the UN's global problem, program on AIDS. Mann's insight was that rights and public health could be harmonized because respect for human rights leads to markedly better prevention and treatment. For example, adopting coercive measures that breach human rights undermines the trust required for people to comply with public health measures, he argued. It drives the disease underground and facilitates its spread. So it turns out, just as a matter of contingent fact, that human rights and public health goods, like achieving herd immunity, are not starkly opposed. But this reconciliation of man's, although important so far as it goes, is a precarious one. It is merely contingent. It's dependent upon circumstances that may change. And what Witt helpfully identifies, uh, what, what, what Witt does is helpfully identify one major change in circumstances that may make it no longer the case that voluntary compliance is the most efficient way to achieve public health goods. Partly it's a matter of the nature of the disease as well. Here, the threat to rights is seen as coming from new digital technologies. So the idea is the advent of digital technologies threatens to upset the precarious balance of rights and public health goods that was achieved in responding to the AIDS crisis. Witt puts it like this, New technologies such as apps for cell phones and cell phone tracking, uh, tracing threaten to alter the precarious balance between liberty and health. If states or other powerful institutions were able to develop technologies capable of testing, tracking and tracing individuals in ways that defeated evasion, then the calculus between individual rights and public health may change. I.e. the idea is it could be that states can develop through digital technologies mechanisms that secure public health goals without having to respect the rights of individuals, without having to go through their consent, for example. And what Witt puts forward here as a hypothetical possibility has acquired a kind of concrete reality as shown by the fact that some authoritarian or less than liberal democratic societies in Asia, such as Singapore, had greater success in stemming the COVID pandemic than liberal democracies like Britain, France, and the US. So implied here is a broader ideological struggle between liberal democracies and rising authoritarian powers in the world. Which of them are best equipped to protect citizens' rights from public health crises like the COVID pandemic? Now, Witt raises a very important question that we all need to struggle with but we can already see that it embodies some highly contestable assumptions. The first of these assumptions concerns the relations between human rights and public health goods. The idea that their relations are essentially contingent, dependent upon circumstances that may change. Whereas I've argued that they are also importantly constitutive, i.e. that a human right can be part of a public health goal. Second, um, perhaps, Witt has this view because he adopts the rather erroneous, I think, aggregative conception of the common good that comes from utilitarian thinking. But I want to close now with some remarks on the role of democracy. So could democracies lose out in the battle to secure the right to health and the wider public health goods of which it is a component? Now, this leads us to consider the tricky question of how human rights are related to democracy. Some theorists, I think, posit an excessively close link between human rights and democracy. So some will say, for example, that the very idea of democracy has baked into it the whole panoply of human rights, that you cannot be truly a democracy unless you comply with the whole set of human rights. I think that is a mistake for reasons very powerfully articulated by the Stanford uh, political theorist, Josiah Ober in his book, Democolis, where he says, democracy is about collective self-government by free and equal citizens, but they're being free and equal, although it implicates some rights, does not implicate the whole set of what we would normally regard as human rights. So there is a distinction between democracy and human rights, and you can be a full-fledged democracy without respecting all human rights. Second, some try to derive the content of the human rights 
of human rights from democratic procedures. So for example, Norman Daniels, a major thinker on the right to health says, well, how do I determine the content of the right to health? Because democracies can get the content of rights wrong. Democracy is an answer to one question, which is, which is the best system of government? But that question about the best, most legitimate system of government um, cannot also be an answer to the question, how do I determine the ethical truth about what the right to health entitles me to? That is a different question. On the other hand, there are those who pose uh, a deep conflict between human rights and democracy, conceiving of human rights as essentially counter-majoritarian norms. I think this is also misguided. Again, I think it's influenced by aggregative conceptions of the common good and the assumption that democratic structures are institutional mechanisms for giving effect to the common good so understood. If that's what democracy is about, aggregating the common good across different individuals with winners and losers, then we're gonna to want to have human rights in play as a mechanism to prevent some individuals from suffering excessive losses. But I think we shouldn't be thinking of the common good in that sense to begin with. I think the key message we should take on the empirical question of the relation between human rights and democracy is um, that articulated by Catherine Sinking in her recent book, um, Evidence for Hope, which is a discussion of the impact of the international human rights regime. Her claim is there is one single most important factor in ensuring the fulfillment of human rights as shown by empirical investigation. And that factor is the existence of a democracy. So the most important thing you can do to foster human rights and compliance with human rights is to create a democratic structure of government. And I simply want to suggest in closing that in response to Witt's challenge, that although digital technology may have a dark authoritarian side, it also has a positive democratic aspect. Indeed, it may help facilitate more radically participatory forms of democratic governance, as theorists like Ellen Landmore at Yale have argued. And going back to COVID, we have a concrete example of this in Taiwan, where under the leadership of the country's first digital minister, Audrey Tang, participative community-built digital tools have been used to create a more democratic, open, and inclusive form of government. Taiwan, until recently had the best in world result, uh, results regarding COVID, um, lowest per capita death rates in the world, whilst avoiding lockdown and only 3% vaccinated, despite having China at its doorstep. Things have become a bit more difficult recently, I think, but still it's quite a remarkable achievement. And it's been facilitated by a digital platform called Polis, which gathers and analyzes diverse opinions from citizens and synthesizes them into insights that can be plugged into democratic processes. And 80% of these have led to actual decisions being made and put into practice. Also, the government has developed tools for combating disinformation campaigns, which have been particularly important regarding the spread of disinformation about COVID. Um, state agencies are required to correct fake claims within two hours, often using the strategy of humor over rumor, so using humor to debunk outlandish claims that are being spread about COVID. Now, of course, all this has been possible only due to a background set of policies that ensure widespread digital education, universal healthcare, and universal broadband access. And I think that's very important because obviously there's gonna be an infrastructure that enables that kind of more participatory digital democracy to take place. And I highly recommend a paper that you can find online by Divya Siddharth called Taiwan Grassroots Digital Democracy That Works, um, which is on the Radical Exchange website. And she goes into the detail of how um, a digitally enabled democracy can actually have these excellent effects. But in short, it seems to me that democracy is part of the ethos that best secures human rights and public health goods alike. And it does so in part by fostering the kind of citizen solidarity required by both. Thank you, and I'm gonna stop there.